I wanted to talk about the precepts. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> October the 12th is that, is that day when we have the opportunity to take the precept ceremony. So um, I, did, I did print up sign-up sheets, but they're in my bag. So if you, if you want to sign up, and I, have, I, I call this sign-up sheet the pre-precept sheet. So this is a sheet for people who are interested in finding out about the classes. And really, it's your pre-decision. This is when you really want to find out some more information. And you might want to go ahead and fill out an application. So you can still, I mean, you can decide right up until the last minute if you don't want to do it. But it, I think if you, if you think about it and want to learn more, and then be more sure this is the time to sign up. So after the meditation, I'll put that, those sheets I have on a clipboard so you can just, I'll put them up and we'll put a little table out for uh, Wednesday, so we, like we did for Buddha Day. Um, I, we've talked a lot about the five precepts and a little bit about the eight precepts, but I think it's all, I always like to stress that, some, you know, we start out with the five precepts. When people feel like they want to take, I think it's usually a sign when people want to, they're, they're saying, I think I want to go uh, keep studying the Buddhist teachings and keep practicing this meditation and just go a little further and maybe the precepts will help give me some structure or the precepts will help me kind of make sense of this whole thing. A little, a little guidance, but the, they, what is the most important thing about the precepts, I think, is that the Buddha sets them out at the very beginning of the path. Like this is really the basic responsibility that we have as we take on this path of uh, Seeing, seeing what the Buddha did in his life and deciding that we want to go in that same direction. But our precepts, our values, our morality, our virtue is such an important part of following the path. And I think that he wants us to be sure that we are committed to that ourselves. And that's, that's why the precepts, like in so many other spiritual paths, the precepts... Um, or that, that foundation of morality has to come first. Everything else is easier when that comes first. And the world is just taking the precepts and trying to live the precepts makes the world a better place because you, you, you're already being, becoming more and more aware of how you behave and how you treat others. And um, it just makes things better for everybody. And if that's as far as you go, that's that's wonderful. It's it's good for it's good for us and it's good for the world. So they're important, and we know the first five now. So uh, someone helped me a lot with this. I always get the five, even the five, confused in their order. So it's body, spirit, and mind. So the body is that we, we do no harm to ourselves or others, so we, do, we kill no living being. The second is also about our body, so it's about what, okay, stealing, and then the third, no stealing, not to take what doesn't belong to us, and the third one is not to engage in sexual misconduct. So. Those are the first three. They're all about our bodily conduct. And the fourth one is, let's see if I can get this right. The last one is intoxication. So the, what? No, lying. Oh, lying is the fourth one, thank you. And the fifth one is not to become intoxicated and to lose our mindfulness through intoxicants or drugs uh, and I think it's pretty. It's not much of a stretch to think about the other intoxicants we have available to us today, which would you know include like gambling, shopping, uh, Netflix, you know, eating, binging, 
uh, just too much, too much of those things when we use it as a way to check out. So any, anything we do to become heedless and mindless is what we need to pay attention to. And that when we probably all have our little, you know, ways we do it when we just feel like I've had enough, I'm just going to check out, I'm just going to do like Cartman, you know, in South Park. Usually that's a sign that we've like had enough and we just want to indulge ourselves or check out for a while. And that's, that's something we need to be aware of. So when we take the eight precepts then, some people decide they've taken the five, they feel like they're working on those. We never, I don't think until we're enlightened do we perfect those. But, but we're using them as kind of good guidelines for um, checking ourselves. Like if we think that we're, things don't feel right in our lives, it's really good to go back to those precepts and think, okay, let me just, let me try saying the precepts every morning and kind of looking again at them, revisiting them every night and see if maybe something's slipping in there. Maybe that's why I'm not, my practice doesn't seem to be going well or something else in my life seems out of balance. It could just be we need to check in again with our precepts. But then when people are ready to do the eight precepts, all we do is add the three more about our speech. So we start out with being honest, telling the truth, not lying. And then we add not to speak maliciously and not to speak harshly and not to engage in idle chatter. That's the hardest one of all. You know, so many, think how many wonderful hours we spend in idle chatter. And uh, I'm, I always, I, I, my intention is always to bring the list of all the things the Buddha said were included in idle chatter, and I have to get that sutta and copy it. It's talking about everything. It's talking about the weather, about politics, about uh, the Buddha said about royalty and about you know entertainment. So it's like us talking about what Tom Cruise is doing or um, what movies are on. So, and I think we have to think about that uh, in a balanced way. We know in our worlds we can't cut that out completely. If we're engaging, like if we're going to the store, we may have some just a kind of little conversations with people that we, who help us or who we run into along the way. But it's that precept, I think, those three about speech are really getting more and more into really seeing how important our speech is and how important it was to the Buddha in terms of developing and, uh, and doing no harm. And so as we look more and more at those things, um, the, the importance of it is one of the awarenesses that can help us just, just knowing, okay, I'm adding three more precepts just about my speech. So this is going to be my dedication, say, for this, to, to work with this and decide that I'm going to make some shifts I think some of those take, like social chatter, takes a big shift it has for me because it's really hard. Sometimes there are certain people that we know and we really like that we just can't, we can't engage in right speech with them sometimes. And that's a hard realization. Um, recently I was talking about speech and someone wrote me a letter and they live in Nevada. I don't know who it is. They'd never, but they heard my, one of my talks about the precepts. I guess it was either on the podcast or somewhere. But I got a long letter from a person who said, uh, "You said that 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 talking about getting talking about politics and debating about politics was not right speech." So he he wrote a long letter about why I didn't understand. I must not have any interest in politics because I'm a nun. <laughs> he doesn't know my, <laughs> he doesn't know, he doesn't know 
Um, but he said, for him, that's his passion, and so that's he thinks it's very important whenever he can to talk to people about politics and how messed up things are. And so I'm still kind of reading and rereading that letter because I thought, wow, somebody went to the trouble. I mean, he went to the trouble of like typing a letter and sending it to me. And so I really want to, you know, I want to be, I really am grateful and respectful of that. But I thought, I just had to kind of laugh that he thought I didn't, I was probably like removed from the daily world, so I didn't understand how important politics were. And, um, and when I'm, when I feel like I understand his point of view enough, I still think that that's one of the things that we, we know when we are out of balance. You know, that's what we need to be looking at when we're kind of obsessed with you know, if you're if you are uh, obsessed with following, did somebody say something? If you're obsessed with following the news, or um, kind of, especially if you're obsessed following certain politicians, you could we can be upset all the time. You know, we're going to hear it over and over and over. So we can be tormented by that kind of obsession, and there's no peace. So we may. And I think this person who wrote me sincerely believes that he, he kind of needs to do that for the world. They need to hear his point of view. And I think that's a good thing for us to look at. Like, are we just engaging in a hopeless conversation? Are we just ta- we might be talking to people who agree with us so we can all get all worked up at the same time? I mean, that's what I find... If I'm talking with people who agree, they agree with me on every point, we just get ourselves worked up. You know, we just, we just can, you know, it's like a bunch of little kids just causing each other to get, go off in temper tantrums or something. And if we're talking to people who we don't agree with, it's probably, you know, there's no, these days there's rarely uh, listening going on from one side or the other because we're all just trying to to uh, make our points and we we don't we don't have a lot of opportunities to really listen to each other so um, I think that's one thing when we think about idle chatter or Todd always says in, in his Tibetan tradition uh, they call it animal talk which really you know sounds pretty crude but that's that's uh, that's how he learned it. And so idle chatter can sound kind of innocent, but when you say animal talk, I think it's insulting animals. So, <laughs> But we all have seen it, even if we don't, even if we haven't engaged in it. We all recognize it. And sometimes we may be more engaged in it than we think, but um, when we take those eight precepts, then we really have that sub- a wonderful thing for us to work on. And the Buddha has so many different uh, situational, when he talks about right speech, there's so many suttas about telling, uh, talking to people about, you know, you need to know the right time to say something, the right place to say it. Uh, you have to be completely... Uh, you know, not angry, but be kind. And it needs to be really necessary if you're going to say something difficult for someone to hear. So they're, they're, with all the conditions that are there to have, to truly have right speech, it cuts down a lot of speech. You know, it really, and that's where our practice helps us. Our meditation practice helps us because we can we can take that extra second because we've worked with our breath and we've worked with our body and we can stop ourselves before we say something and we keep we can practice with that and then before we say something that might embarrass somebody or maybe it's not the right time for them to be able to hear it um, we can we can use our meditation practice and the with to give us that extra second that might let us know. I'll, I'll say this later. I'll do, talk about this in private. 
or maybe this isn't the right time to bring it up. So these things all tie in together. Then when we then the next one that we can take. So we usually say the five precepts. The eight precepts are called the eight lifetime precepts. And there is a second kind of eight precepts, but that's uh, usually used on Poya days when people go to the temple. If you're in Asian countries, if you go, well, in Sri Lanka and the Theravadan countries, it's on the full moon and the, the new moon. Is it the new moon and the full moon? And you, they just hang out at the temple most of the day. So that's when the women wear white and the men wear white. And they have talks and they can go and maybe uh, join different classes or talks and they have an opportunity to, they can go and listen to chanting or go and sit and meditate. But they, they basically are at the temple all day. So on those days they take eight precepts for that day and the whole time they're there, which might be eight to twelve hours, they honor those precepts. So that is not to be confused with the eight lifetime precepts we take. Because if you do the eight that's for that day, those two days a month at the temple, it includes not eating after a certain time of day, after midday, and not having sex. So. If you're a lay person, that's the only time there's a, a um, there's anything about not engaging in sexual conduct, and it's just on those days you're at the temple. So, um, it, but the um, our eight lifetime precepts are the ones where we take the five and then add three more about speech. Then the ten precepts are what we call the bodhisattva vows. And they're really the ten paramitas, which you can, you know, find in a lot of the different suttas. So they're they're the ten qualities that people can work on that cover. That's uh, remember when Bhante Bhadia had the little song he sang. It's Dana Sila Nekama Vidya and Panya, and it's like Mary. Had, what did we sing? What do we sing like that? A B C the alphabet song. They, they sing it for this. So it's generosity, virtue, which are the what we call the precepts to, renunciation, energy, and wisdom, um, patience, truth, what? I can't hear you. And metta, and then metta. So I'm going to say go with compassion, okay? Uh, Kanti satcha. Uh, aditena. Aditena is determination, not, not compassion, determination. So truth, uh, patience, truth, and um, determination, uh, and then loving kindness and equanimity. And so those are the ten bodhisattva qualities. And the bo- a bodhisattva is someone in training to become a Buddha. You know, you've decided. Uh, so those are, but they're also the qualities that we're always working on when we're, when we're practicing on the cushion, when we're living our daily lives, when we're trying to live with, a, within, with our precepts and work with those. Those are the qualities we're always talking about and always working with. But when you take those, 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 uh, that is a pre- those is precepts, they give you qualities that you can focus, uh, your, you know, that can be part of your focus. Because we all, all the Buddhist teachings are just, they're endless list of things and qualities and, uh, things you can look at. You, sometimes we get lost in all the teachings and all the, there's this five of these and eight of these and ten of these. So those bodhisattva qualities can give you entire areas to study. You can study patience. You can study determination. You can just you can study those things. And lots of uh, teachers have taken those qualities from the Buddha's teachings and you know written about just those qualities. So it's easy to find really wonderful. Uh, 
commentaries and teachings with the, with the qualities. So that's, and we, we start with the five, then the, the eight, then the ten. And so when you take the five, you can, you get a Buddhist name that one of the, the, either Bhante Sujata or the monastics, uh, put the names together and give them to people. And they're all beautiful names in Pali that represent qualities. So, except where's Bhante Asaji? His, yours means horse tamer, right? Tame, <laughs> your name, Asaji. Tamer of, how would you say it in English? We always tease them about he's a horse tamer, trainer. What? Well, we, we always think your, your name means horse tamer. <laughs> Bhante Amita, what does your name mean? Endless? And Wimala means clarity. What does Dhammika mean? So one who practices Dhamma would be... So those are the, ki- the kind of names that people get are the, are the same type of name. And so that, that you get when you get, take your five precepts. And usually, uh, it's, it's, I think it's good to just keep the name your teacher gives you and work with that. I, I don't know if there's anything magical about it or special, but it's, it's good. I've known a few monastics who kept asking their teacher to change their names. <laughs> they, they, and you know, one, one, te- one teacher, one nun told me when one student asked her three times to change her name, and, the te- and that teacher would tell them the name before their ordination and gave, gave them the choice, like, do you like this name? And she had one student that, w- that I knew and that student asked her three times to change her name. And, th- and she said, she told me, the teacher said, you know that's going to be a difficult student when they, get, when they are never satisfied with the name that you, that you want them to take. And that turned out to be true. So it's, it's good, whatever, your name, whatever the name you're given, it's, one, it's fun and it's, uh, it's, it's always good to work with it and to embrace it, I think. So, um, and here at Blue Lotus, we do that ceremony once a year. It's October the 12th this year. And that is just our tradition. That's not a, uh, in Asian countries, people take the precepts. Sometimes they recite them every single day. Every time they go to the temple, they'll recite it. Or whenever they have a, like whenever the Sri Lankan people may come here to do a special service, it's part of what they chant to the monks when they begin that service. They always chant the first, the five precepts. So for them, it's it's a, like a constant thing in their lives. The the same way we might have learned the Bible or the the Talmud or something when we were younger, or you know we knew the Ten Commandments at one time or whatever we were, whatever religion we were raised in, but. Um, the, the ceremony that we do is just our way of giving people a way to, um, you know, f- kind of have something that you hold on to as you move forward in, in, the, in the teachings and your, your own journey with them. So does anybody have any comment or any kind of question about those that they, that's a lingering question? Uh-huh. Is there a different style of meditation, different than with asana, where you would maybe do the precept as like your object or focus, or where do they come into play? In you can use that. You can use it as a focus of your of meditation, and th- and that's that's fine to do. Like if you're if you're just sitting and you're calm and you're breathing, you can use Maybe say you have a stomach ache. You can use that as a focus of your attention, you know. And just whatever arises for you, you can you and you can re, even relate it to one of those uh, concepts. 
And what you want to do is not try to like sit there and remember everything you know about it, but really, if it's the focus of your meditation, you want it. You want it to be. You want to work with it in a non-analytical way. You know, it's not. Wordless. If you can do it, if you can do it that way, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah. So, does if that makes sense? Yeah, it's always yeah. Can you still keep your religious identity? A- Absolutely. Yeah. So a lot of people think you have to. You're becoming a Buddhist, and we just really don't think that way because we're not. We don't ever want anybody to to give up their religious, unless there's some direct, like you believe in killing people, so you couldn't take the first precept, right? <laughs> if, but you know, there's it, it, there's a lot of meshing with with uh, with all religions, with the, with their whatever their precepts or their values are. So um, I think it's really important that people not let go of a spiritual tradition that still feeds them and is good and and real for them. Um, so you can for for in in this world it's perfectly okay to do both. Because if there's ever anything that where they don't fit together, then then you might want to think about or ask questions about that. But I don't think there are too many things that are actually Butting heads. If you go back to the original teachers, so, and and I know, uh, especially if we're in a certain culture, we we have rich spiritual traditions in our culture. So if people don't want to, nobody's being nobody's ever should be asked to leave that to to embrace something else. That's a good question. Thank you. Okay. Now, don't don't knock anybody over rushing to sign up for the precepts. <laughs> but it's uh, it's not it's we have some books. You know, we always recommend. We I think we have all three books now in the bookstore. Uh, I know I always get books on Kindle, so I know they're all available in that. The Mindfulness Survival Kit by Thich Nhat Hanh, which is really beautiful. And it talks a lot about the precepts, and sometimes in a different way than we talk about them. So we we really have embraced a lot of the some of in our precept ceremony some of the uh, some of the language of Thich Nhat Hanh and some of the understanding of the precepts. I think the way he talks about them is uh, really helps understand them. So mindfulness survival kit. And Bonte G's book, uh, Mindfulness in Plain English. And there's another one, Buddhism Plain and Simple. And that's by, I think, somebody, last name is Hagen, H-A-G-A-N. So those are three books. And there's also What the Buddha Taught, which is a small book, but it's dense. <laughs> I always think of it that way. It's, you can read it like a paragraph at a time, and you have a lot to work with. But but after a while, it gets easier. <laughs> and it's a good book to keep. So there's plenty of time, and we'll have applications too. So we'll have, we want to uh, make sure people have been meditating for about six months at least. And that's that's important because if you if you know, then you know, okay, I'm I'm I've been doing this, and I really want to continue studying the teachings of the Buddha, practicing meditation, maybe I'll check out the precepts. There's no need to do it too early. You know in Asian countries they do it. Westerners start out meditating first because that's what we, we like to do that. Or we like to like to do that. <laughs> we want to like to do that. And, uh, and then we kind of back into the precepts and stuff. Um, and then in Asia, they always start and they build the foundation so it's, it's the precepts for a long time and then meditation comes later in general. So 
Um, thank you. We just have a couple of announcements. And one is that this Saturday is the Sri Lankan lunch that the monks are making. And we will now have new um, compostable containers. I'm so happy about that. Isn't that wonderful? Bhante Amit has ordered them. They should be here. And he's, if anybody wants to know about com com compostable containers, he's now an expert on it. <laughs> He's now, so I'm really happy about that. I think that's just wonderful. And um, the lunch is wonderful. It's $10, and you can, it, they need to, is, is there a sign-up sheet, or it's all online? Okay. So you can, you can is, and it's okay to eat them downstairs on Saturday? Okay, you can eat downstairs, or you can, pick it up to go, then you can buy a lot and feed a whole bunch of people somewhere, take them home. And the other thing is uh, Sunday, this, this coming Sunday is the open house. And that the hours, Sherry, what are the hours for that? 10 to 4. 10 to 4. And the monastics will, the, the four of us will be there. I was going to say all the monastics, and this we're all the monastics right now. Um, will be there, and the teachers, like the yoga teachers and our the uh, teachers who teach special classes, Greg, you're a yoga teacher, Sherry's a yoga teacher, who, anybody else? Yeah, people who teach, kind of teach ongoing classes here and do different things, and um, it should be a nice day. People can bring refreshments to share with new people, I'm assuming, right? That's why the cook what the cookies are all about. Um, and it'll the, too. the little classes like we had that last time. That was that was a really that was fun, the one that was we did before. You I didn't do it, you guys did it. But those classes were wonderful. Little short like mini classes and you could get Lots of information about the Ayurvedic thing, essential oils, and uh, now we have a lot of teachers teaching things on well-being and health. So it's free, and it should be a really nice way to also kind of, if you have friends who have never been here, and they're a little, they might hesitate coming to a meditation session, they can come to the open house and feel more comfortable because it's so it's informal. And that's 10 to 4 on Sunday. Yeah, so bring some friends and, and come, okay? It's absolutely, it's children-friendly, right? Okay, that'll be great. And you know, they, uh, last time they had uh, origami and things that people could do while they were kind of relaxing in between the looking at things. So there'll be something like that, I'm sure. Right? Bhante Amita? Bhante Asaji? <laughs> They're good at origami. So um, hope you can come to that. It'll, it'll be a nice day, even if the weather's bad outside. Okay. So let's all stand and pay our respects to the teachings of the Buddha. <laughs> 